in 1936, 1937, 1938, Joseph Stalin decided he was going to consolidate his power, consolidate his hold on the Soviet Union by executing everybody he thought was in his way. Um, it's now known as the Great Purge or the Great Terror. And it wasn't just like Stalin eliminating other political elites he thought might be in line for his job. Stalin ordered the killing of hundreds of thousands of people, by some estimates, more than a million people. And thanks to the records historians started to get access to right after the collapse of the Soviet Union, in the mid to late 90s, historians were finally able to pinpoint a previously unknown site inside Russia, northern Russia, where as many as 9,000 people had been shot in the Great Purge and buried. It's just a huge site, an unmarked site, with hundreds of burial pits, 236 different pits containing more than 9,000 bodies. They didn't find it until the summer of 1997. And once they found it, they put up these stones, these markers, to commemorate it. They turned it into a memorial for the victims of Stalin. They started to hold an annual day of remembrance there. After about 20 years, though, Russian President Vladimir Putin decided that that was enough, and he didn't want any more of that. Putin, broadly, decided that Stalin had gotten a bad rap. The Soviet Union broadly got a bad rap. Stalin in particular got a bad rap. You know, what benefit is there in all this supposed history, all these stories that make him seem like such a bad guy, that make the Soviet Union seem so flawed? Let's restore the glory, right? Sure, millions dead, but those people aren't around to tell their stories anymore. So why should any of us tell that story, let alone hear it? And so... The historian who had first located that site in northern Russia, he was arrested. They charged him with being a pedophile. The Russian government then announced plans to bring bulldozers into that site. They were going to dig up the bodies and show that this wasn't a, a mass burial site of Stalin's victims. This must have been something else entirely. The victims there must all have been Russians who were killed by foreigners. Because, of course, there was no gulag. There was no great terror. There was no great purge. Stalin was a stand-up guy. Russia's history is pristine. Anybody who says otherwise is obviously a degenerate, a monster. After the historian who heroically tracked down the records and discovered that site, after he was locked up and charged randomly with pedophilia, they did the same thing to the head of the local museum who had effectively been the on-site caretaker for, caretaker for the site once it was discovered. He had also been vocal in his opposition to the Russian government coming in and digging it up with bulldozers. He, too, they did the same thing to him. They arrested him and charged him with being a pedophile. In both cases, the charges were widely believed to be trumped up and completely false, but they were nevertheless loudly trumpeted on Russian state TV. And the association they were trying to make was clear. You want to expose something about Russia's very dark past? Well, obviously, you're a degenerate and a monster. Not even a regular criminal, not even, not even a regular person who's just wrong. Not even just a regular criminal, but a monster who must be destroyed. That local historian who ran the museum near the burial site, it was like the de facto caretaker for the burial site, he spoke out against bulldozing it. It was widely understood that the allegations against him were ridiculous and completely false. But it, they did their job. They got, they served as a pretext for locking him up. He ended up dying in prison. Never saw freedom again. With those guys out of the way, the Russian government has taken down the memorial at the site. They've redesignated the whole burial site as a sightseeing locale. It used to be a heritage site because of the mass murder that happened there. They've redesignated it now as a, as a national sightseeing locale. Yeah, what a nice forest. What a great spot for a picnic. What are all these big square pits? Before he became what he is now, which is basically dictator for life, um, in the late 90s, Vladimir Putin was head of the FSB, 
Um, he was head of the FSB when, when Boris Yeltsin was president of Russia in the late 90s. And Yeltsin, like lots of Russian leaders, uh, had a corruption problem. More specifically, the problem Yeltsin had in 1997 was that there was a prosecutor in Russia who was investigating corruption at the highest levels in the Kremlin, including Yeltsin and his family. And for a time, it seemed like that corruption investigation might be the undoing of Yeltsin and his family and his cronies. Vladimir Putin, as head of the FSB, took care of that problem for Boris Yeltsin. Putin arranged for a video to be broadcast on national television that showed the prosecutor, or somebody who maybe kind of looked like the prosecutor, um, in bed with not one, but two young, very young females. The video was low enough quality and it was shot from sort of oblique enough angles that you couldn't necessarily tell with the naked eye who this grown man was with this, these girls in this bed. But Putin stepped up in his authority as head of the FSB. Vladimir Putin assured the Russian public that he could guarantee that the man in the video was, in fact, that prosecutor. And so that was the end of that prosecutor. And that was the end of the corruption investigation into Boris Yeltsin and his family. And in gratitude, or at least in payback, Boris Yeltsin decided that he would name as the next prime minister of Russia and then the next president of Russia, that FSB guy who helped him out, Vladimir Putin. That's how Vladimir Putin rose to power in the first place in Russia. That's how he got control of the Russian government by generating, effectively, a false pedophilia claim against just the right guy at just the right moment. That's how he got into power. Pedophilia, of course, is the most repulsive of all human behavior. It is so repulsive, it is so evil, that it makes us see red, right? It is almost literally unthinkable. And it, therefore, understandably, can make us stop seeing anybody who's even accused of it as our fellow human. Anybody abetting it or even abiding it, it's basically the same thing. Your brain just instantly goes to monster, right? Understandably, as it is the most repulsive of all human evil. And when confronted with it, we almost can't process it. And it is a deep, dark thing to recognize that about human nature, right? The capacity of some people for that behavior, for that level of evil, and our collective, massive human revulsion and rejection of that evil. But recognizing that, to decide that you're going to try to harness that for political gain, that you're going to make false accusations of that kind— systematically to reduce your political opponents to non-human status, that is a horrific abuse of its own. And it has become one of the hallmarks of modern authoritarianism, not only in Russia, but especially in Russia under Vladimir Putin. It's, it's, an, it's an obvious and frequent enough political tactic in Putin's Russia that in, in 2016, not, not long after our bizarre 2016 presidential election, uh, the New York Times ran a feature on how this particular tactic kept coming up increasingly in Putin's Russia. You see the headline there. Foes of Russia say child pornography is planted to ruin them. It's so evil. It's so, like, meta-level exploitative and evil and base and cynical. But of course they use it, right? Vladimir Putin has been in power 22 years now in, in Russia. And that particularly sick hallmark of his time in power has been a constant. He has used it against all different kinds of political opponents, and it always works. During the Trump years here, um, we started to get the conspiracy theory cult version of it on the political right uh, here in America. The QAnon pro-Trump online cult built its whole bizarre central conspiracy theory around the same kinds of false and fantastical claims that everybody in the world who isn't Trump is 
allied in some big satanic pedophilia ring. And someday Trump will catch them all and, and bring on mass public executions of all the Democrats and all the celebrities. And then finally we'll be free from the satanic pedophile conspiracy that runs the world. That's the basic idea of the bizarre pro-Trump QAnon conspiracy theory cult. And on the one hand, it is freakish, right? It is truly bizarre. It is a conspiracy theory cult, and you have to be like an extremism anthropologist to understand any of it. On the other hand, it's been remarkably persistent during the Trump era in American conservative politics. And it does have this clear political point, which is why authoritarian movements and dictators do some version of this all over the world. It's what some political scientists call eliminationist rhetoric. It's one thing for you to be competing in a democracy against your political opponents, right? Against fellow human beings who have different ideas about governing and may the best candidate win. It's another thing if everybody on the, the other side of you in politics is inhuman, is a monster, a beast, who you have to protect children from, right? And who must be eliminated if we are ever to have any sort of civilization, right? You don't compete against a monster in an election. You destroy them, right? You call for their public execution. And when it comes to power, the idea that you'd let one of these monsters have power because of something as small and pointless and beside the point as them winning an election, well, that's unthinkable. The election is much less important than keeping the monsters at bay. Eliminationist rhetoric. Playing with these kinds of false accusations, this kind of false accusation in particular, it is lurid and disgusting and shocking and bizarre, but it is also playing with the worst kind of fire in terms of what we are capable of in our understandable human nature. Because, you know, for for people who believe these kinds of false allegations— even for people who don't necessarily believe them explicitly, but they ambiently absorb that these are the kinds of accusations that are circulating out there about people in politics. I mean, that can be used to justify almost any level of extreme response, any level of violence even in response. That's why it's a dictator's tactic. That is why it is a fascist authoritarian tactic. There's a website out there that you might have come across called bidennoms.com. When I first found out there was this Biden noms website, I, of course, thought it was about the snacks that President Biden is nomming on. It was like an ice cream tribute site. Uh, But it's actually bidennoms.com is about Biden nominees for government posts. Uh, It's the website of a right wing group called the American Accountability Foundation. Um, And it's not shy about what the group is setting out to do. Uh, They say at BidenNoms.com, quote, personnel is policy. We are working to ensure that leaders within the federal government reflect the values and concerns of the American people, not the liberal coastal elites and their woke allies in corporate America. And then just like they're sort of hunting trophies, the site has uh, headshot after headshot of headshot after headshot of of Biden nominees. Some Some of them famous ones for sure, but some of them you've definitely never heard of. Um, they're trying, the thing that's unique about this group is that they're not sort of trying to keep one person who they don't like or two people who they don't like out of the job. They're trying to keep every single Biden nominee out of the job, or at least to dirty them all up along the way. Everybody Biden nominated who's going through the confirmation process, they're going after them simply because Biden nominated them, all of them. Now, opposition research isn't new. It's a sort of gross part of how Washington operates, but it has always been thus. This group, though, is different, and investigative reporter Jane Mayer at The New Yorker has been busy sort of finding them out. Quote, the American Accountability Foundation's approach represents a new escalation in partisan warfare. Rather than attack a single candidate or nominee, the group aims to thwart the entire Biden slate, meaning every Biden nominee full stop. They claim to have successfully derailed nominations like Biden's nominee for comptroller of the currency by ginning up a fake narrative that she was somehow a communist, an actual communist. Also, the nomination of Sarah Bloom Raskin for a position at the Federal Reserve Board. They claimed falsely that uh, a, a delay in her disclosure of a stock trade was because she had somehow abused her position as a previous government, government employee to obtain some sort of secret financial benefit for herself 
It was completely false. There's mudslinging, but then there's this. What's different about this is the wholesale approach to every nominee of the Biden administration uh, and the willingness to levy these attacks, not only sort of um, separate from the facts, but separate in many cases from common decency at a wholesale level. Joining us now is Jane Mayer. She's chief Washington correspondent for The New Yorker. She's also the author of Dark Money, the hidden history of the billionaires behind the rise of the radical right. Ms. Mayer, it's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you for making time. Well, great to be with you. Welcome back. And that was a fantastic introduction. I had never heard the oh. phrase eliminist, eliminationist rhetoric before, but it's perfect in describing what this group tries to do. Well, uh, thank you. That's nice to say. But I, I mean, when, when I was watching the Judge Jackson confirmation hearings and um, Senator Hawley and Senator Blackburn and conservative media started going down this line with her, it was shocking because the allegation they were making against her, saying that she was you know, soft on sexual abuse of children, was so divorced from the facts and was felt so wrong. But it also does dovetail with these other political tactics that we see in dictatorships and that we sort of started to see in the Trump era of the Republican Party. And it really had me wondering who cooked this up, because I didn't think Josh Hawley made it up himself. It seems like you've discovered that this group was the origin story for that false attack. Yeah, Holly had some little helping hands, um, and it was this group, um, the American Accountability um, Foundation, which, uh, believe it or not, um, is a tax-exempt organization. You can um, give money to it and get a tax deduction while it smears everybody in sight. Um, and um, it does, you know, sort of phony research, basically, and and a, a pretty sloppy job if you really look into it. Um, most of the mud that it slunk has um, dissolved when you take a really close look. But the problem is, for a lot of the lesser known nominees, people aren't really looking very carefully. Um, and what caught my eye about it was that I was writing a little bit about the nomination of Sarah Bloom Raskin um, to become the vice chairman of the Fed for supervision. She's incredibly uh, well qualified, I mean, and, and very well liked, um, liked by the banking world also, um, and, and had been confirmed twice before to very senior positions at the Fed and at the Treasury Department with um, bipartisan unanimous support. And suddenly there were these allegations that were a pretext basically, that had nothing to do with reality, that um, was kind of a made up story um, claiming that she had an ethical problem. And they didn't really go after her for what um, I think is the real beef that they had with her, which was that she had said a few things about climate change and how it posed a risk to the economy. So I started looking at this group, trying to figure out who are these people? And of course, it turned out that a lot of the senators were getting their research from this group and the senators were getting their money from the fossil fuel industry. And they needed a pretext to take her down in order to stop um, the Fed from including climate change as one of the things that it might consider as an important economic risk. So anyway, I started trying to find out who these people were. You also write about the expensive lengths to which this group appears to have gone to come up with these smears for some other nominees, including a woman who was put forward to be comptroller of the, of the currency, the one who was uh, denounced as a communist. When you describe them like sending people all over the world to try to, um, to, try to dig stuff up that they could mischaracterize and, and take out of context and use against her, and then senators sort of, as senators avidly digested it and, and, and threw it at her during that hearing, it raises this question of where they're getting all the funding to do this. And Jane, you've been so good at untangling um, how dark money works. What were you able to find out about where the funding for this group comes from and who's doing it? Well, um, surprisingly, um, it uh, the, the, the financial trail goes back to Donald Trump. Um, he has a leadership pack with um, hundreds of over a hundred million dollars in it. And, and one of those million dollars went from his e-leadership pack to the Conservative Partnership Institute, which is a an organization on Capitol Hill. It's kind of like an island of Elba for the, the Trump administration. You've got Mark Meadows working there and a number of other people from the Trump world up there, Cleta Mitchell. 
Um, and um, it spawned this other little sort of group, which is the, the American Accountability Foundation. So it's, it really is an offshoot of the, of the Trump world and being funded in part by the Trump world. Jane Mayer, uh, chief Washington correspondent for The New Yorker magazine, um, untangling uh, these these knots one at a time for us. Thank you, Jane. I appreciate your reporting. Thanks for talking to us about it tonight. Thanks for having me.